Thank you very much. And welcome, you guys. Ooh, there we go. And the oh. lunch is making you a little proud. Okay, so we are going to have some fun today and also learn about some great social lessons. Uh, a couple things first. So Tom talked about the hashtag. If you hopefully you're going to tweet, 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 tweet. And uh, my handle is Sandy underscore Carter. If you don't put the underscore, you're actually be tweeting about a guy in London, and that's not me. Um, so someone just got that. <laughs> Unless it needs to be me. Uh, so, so what I was doing one day is um, receiving over and over and over again these Facebook requests for people from people to join Candy Crush. Anybody get some of those? And over and over and over. And finally, I said, "All right, already, I'm going to accept one of these." And that was not probably a good thing because I became addicted to Candy Crush. So, I'm a candy. Anybody else love Candy Crush today? Wow, only two in a room. At, oh, three. Thank you. So what I'm going to do today is actually, as I was playing these games very late at night sometimes to try to get to the next level, I found there were a lot of lessons about social that actually were embedded in Candy Crush. And so what I'm going to do today is make this fun and showcase to you many of the social business lessons that I've learned working with companies in 78 different countries around the world and how those come through actually and, and what I was playing at Candy Crush. Now, if you haven't played Candy Crush, it's okay. I want to teach you really quickly the rules. It's a very simple game, so you'll get all the lessons as well, even if you're not a Candy Crush expert. So let me just give you a little bit of background, just because Candy Crush has graciously allowed me to use all their pictures. Um, they are the fastest growing and the number one game out there today. They have about 97 million folks, very simple rules. They keep adding levels, so there are like over 500 levels now today, and it keeps moving up and up and up and up and up. And the goal of the game is to connect these three little candies together. You have to get like three green in a row, three yellow in a row. Essentially, that's the, that's the game, so it's kind of a matching game. So as we looked at that, there were six lessons that came up over and over and over again for me that I've learned both from business as well as from Candy Crush. So let me just walk through those and we'll go through each one separately. So the first one is something your mother probably told you. You catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. The second one is you can really leverage what you're doing and you can get help by sharing expertise across the world. The third one is community. Community is a tie that binds. The fourth one, our opportunities are everywhere, but few have eyes to see them. That actually came out of a fortune cookie I had as well, so that's why it sounds like that. The next one is as well. You can tell I like Chinese food. The wise man forfeits his fortune when he does not trust the data. That's a fortune cookie. That's a fortune yeah, cookie. Yeah. There you go, maybe. Yeah, or at P.F. Chang's. <laughs> And then don't wait too long, uh, the time is now. So those are the six lessons that we're going to go through, and we're going to start with the first one. So if I, when I'm playing Candy Crush game, one of the interesting things I think about the game is that they always acknowledge your success. So you probably have seen some of the ads on, they're, they're doing some really cute ads now where the, the older lady's sitting there and she's banging candy on the table and she goes, sweet. Well, when you make a match and you score a lot of points in Candy Crush, you get that little sweet sound. And my two daughters, I have a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old, when, when they're playing Candy Crush and they get there, they're like, Mom, Mom, look, you know, I got the sweet, I got this. So they're really excited. And the reason they're excited is that they're getting rewarded. Now, you could argue if that's a great reward or not, <laughs> but in, in psychology, psychology would tell you that people like to get rewarded, whether it's a pat on the back or whether it's a thank you or whether it's a, a sweet sound, that rewards are really important. So as I watched them play the game and as I was playing a game, I thought about social as well. So think about some of the great social sites that you have out there. Many of the ones that are truly engaging and truly getting people to come back, they're giving some sort of reward for doing some really great things. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples of this, of this principle. So um, Honda, Honda um, obviously is a, is a car manufacturing company, but one of the things that they did is they've been focusing social on their employees. Now I don't know if you guys know this or not, but today more companies are doing social inside their four walls than outside their four walls. 
And why is that? Well, a dear friend of mine who runs customer experience at the Ritz, Ritz is one really nice hotel, like the W's, but really nice hotel. Um, he was doing a presentation with me and he said something that stuck with me forever, which was, you cannot have great customer experience unless you have great employee engagement. Right? So you can't have great customer experience if you don't have great employee engagement. And what we've learned is that social, when you leverage social internally, your real goal there is to engage your employees so that they feel part of what you're doing. And that's exactly what Honda did. Honda really wanted to focus on that client experience and so they approached it by how to engage their employees. And after we had done a whole set of research for them, we found that motivation, like the sweet sound of the Candy Crush game, can really be demonstrated through social. In fact, it's more effective through social. So they created a mobile app, it's Social Mobile. They use one of our business partners called Kango Gift, if you're interested, Kango Gift. They're based out of New York. And what they enable managers to do, as well as other employees, is to give instant recognition. Now, the thing about this that is really social is that when you provide recognition in the social world, who sees that? Not just your manager, right? I love getting notes about my employees where they copy me on them, but it's just me, right? I'm one person. But if you leverage social to thank somebody, it's very public. Therefore, that recognition is expanded multiple times. Um, I think the other really big thing is that it's instant, it's real time. Think about today, people want stuff done you know, in an instant. They don't want to wait for that performance review that may happen once a year or twice a year. So what Honda did is they installed a mobile social game available on, the, on the, any mobile device and they were able to provide to their employees and their managers a way to recognize their employees. Now their engagement has gone up exponential their employee engagement. But one of the things I thought was quite fascinating, following that rule of Candy Crush, if you look at the chart over to the right, this was in a six month period, um, managers providing recognition to their employees went from 20% to 80%. 20% to 80%. So think about that, 20% to 80%. Why, why did that happen? Well, one, it was social. So as the managers recognized their employees, it became viral, it was instant, it was done on a mobile device, right? So I think some of these lessons that Honda had here I think are really important. Now 68% of social is done on a mobile device, 68% of social. So another I think interesting lesson here is that if you have a separate team doing your mobile strategy and a separate team doing your social strategy, probably not doing it right because those two things are so blended together, it's so important. Just like Honda recognized, if they had done this on a, on a desktop system, do you think this would have been as effective? Absolutely not. So this recognition I think is, is really important. Um, I wanted to show you something, I'm going to give you kind of um, external references outside of IBM, but also I wanted to show you how we're drinking our own champagne. And so. This is, what the, I run a group at IBM right now, besides being a social business evangelist, that focuses in on entrepreneurship and partnering. So it's called ecosystem development. And one of the things that we did is we said, you know, we want to make sure that we are providing the very best service for our entrepreneurs and for our partners. Well, how do you do that? Again, going back to the comment that the Ritz made, great customer or partner experience is driven by great employee engagement. So we presented an, a social dashboard where our employees could engage both with each other as well as with the management team. So you can see here we have a hero wall where we recognize heroes and again it's instant and it's very public. In fact, I was very pleased because uh, we were in there on the hero wall and our CEO came in and commented and you can imagine having the CEO of your company comment on somebody's performance. Um, we have an idea factory which is able to generate different ideas, so it's a great way we vote. We do polling and vote on different ideas. We have tell us your story, and so 
employees can come in and tell us what they did that was spectacular, and then we can leverage that as best practices. And then I have my own uh, corner as well. So those are just two examples of how you can catch more uh, bees with honey than with vinegar by encouraging, motivating, making it easy for your managers and employees to recognize others, to communicate with each other, and to really engage. Again, that employee engagement leading to great customer experience. So that's our lesson number one. Okay, lesson number two. I'm going to start out with my Candy Crush example here too. So one of the interesting things about Candy Crush, I don't know how many of you guys uh, have seen this, but when you, when you don't make it through the game, they have this really wonderful thing that comes up and says, you failed. <laughs> Not a great motivator for me. And they say, okay, you can either pay money, which our family rule is we don't pay any money to Candy Crush. We only, we only get to the next level by working. So if you don't pay money, you have to give up, which two words aren't in my vocabulary. But there is one other option that you have, and that is that you can ask, essentially ask for help. You can reach out. They've linked the game in through Facebook, and I can go out to my Facebook friends and I can say, help, I need another life. Help, I need advice. Help, I need to get to the next level. Quite ingenious, right? Because of course, they're making a lot of money because I know a lot of people just pay money to get to that next level. But it's another form of community and another way of sharing expertise. Now, granted, this is sharing expertise about a game, a simple game, but still it's sharing that expertise. Do you guys know today that businesses lose per employee one day out of five, one day out of five, for employees that are looking for information that they know exists somewhere in their company, but they can't find it, right? Anybody feel like that? You know it exists somewhere, but you cannot find it. So think about how you could use social to find that expertise, whether you're a customer or whether you're an employee. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples of this lesson I learned with Candy Crunch, right? That is. It's a great idea to be able to reach outside of yourself and your own knowledge to find expertise that exists somewhere else. Um, I wanted to use this example because this is Berlitz. Um, I don't know if you guys know, this company is actually based in Japan. It's not a US company, it's actually based in Japan. Um, and I think this is really interesting because as they are, you know, they do a lot of language learning, teaching different people how to learn different languages. And they always learn different ways to do that. And they have different teachers who are more successful than others. And so they came to us and they said, you know what? We'd love to raise the level of everybody as they're learning language. And so how could we do that in a way that fits our new population? And so they have a social community and they share best practices, best practices in Italian and learning Japanese and learning English. Um, and then from those best practices, they do data mining and use analytics to discover what was common across all the best practices. And by using those analytics, they're able to offer new instructional manuals. In fact, in some cases, it's 50 to 60% faster for them to produce a new instructional manual because they're now sharing that expertise, right? So essentially what they've done is they've asked for help. They've asked someone to give them a life. And they're doing that in an aggregated fashion across all of their instructors. So the quality of their material and the quality of what they deliver in the marketplace only goes higher and higher. So I think it's a great example to show that social being used to share expertise is a great way to leverage social across the board. Now, um, this is another, I think, really interesting example of sharing expertise. And this is um, Streetline. They're actually using this in Los Angeles right now. Again, you can see it's a social tool that's available on an iPhone or an Android device. So it's mobile, so social and mobile together. And one of the things that is quite interesting is in Los Angeles, we determined that about 30% of the traffic in Los Angeles is made by people driving around looking for a parking spot. So I live in New York right now. I'm hoping they bring this to New York soon. And I've seen that the traffic here, I don't know how many people are from Atlanta. Your traffic is pretty bad here too, right? Probably people driving around looking for that Chick-fil-A, I guess. Um, so what they've done is they've created a social app that enables people to share, I'm leaving my parking spot. 
Um, you know, this parking spot's empty. I spotted a parking spot. Obviously, they don't want people to use the device when they're actually driving, so this is being used by the passenger of the car. But they have actually been able to reduce the traffic in Los Angeles using this social mobile application. And so what are they doing? They're, again, they're sharing expertise across the board, sharing knowledge that would not exist with a single person, but leveraging this to, um, to, to uh, really create a better environment across Los Angeles to find uh, parking. And this is now gonna be combined with a lot of the Internet of Things, where they're gonna put sensors in everything. So this is now gonna become social plus Internet of Things, being able to sense different parking situations and traffic situations as well. Um, along this lines, I wanted to share with you, we do a lot of entrepreneurial contests uh, inside of IBM. And there was recently this really cool example that a young student out of University of Stuttgart created in the same vein of sharing expertise. So he's created an application that can run on your iPhone or your Android device. And what it does is it taps into the expertise of weather prediction, of traffic. And so let's say that your route to work, there is a traffic accident and someone shared that information or it's snowing and it's gonna take you longer to get into a work. It automatically adjusts your alarm on your Android, your iPhone, so that you get up 30 minutes earlier or 45 minutes earlier so you can be to work or to where you need to be on time. So I told him I definitely want that application. Again, you know, all that information is embedded into a single, a single application. So this is number two. I, the lesson learned is sharing expertise has strong return on investment for clients, in this particular uh, case with Streetline, or Berlitz internal social, lots of return on investment that comes by enabling and using social to share expertise across the board. So that's lesson number two. Okay, our thir third lesson is gonna be around um, community. Community as a tie that binds. So one of the interesting things that I think um, Candy Crush does as they're looking across the board of how they improve the game is they allow you to look at rankings of scores. But a lot of games, and a lot of things that you look at today, they do it across the world, right? You're number one, but here's everybody in the world who's playing this game. With 97 million people, this is not very motivating, right? Because you don't know any of those folks. But with Candy Crush, they actually have a map, and by level, they show you how your score compares to your friends. Again, they draw upon Facebook to pull in the number of friends that you have. And then you can compare at every level how you did versus your friends. Now, why do you think that would be better than using the whole world? Any ideas? It's personal. It's personal. Motivating. Motivating, because it's your friends, right? You know who they are. Yep, in fact, when my father-in-law calls me and says, ha ha, I just went to this level and you're way back there, it's very motivating. It seems yes. possible. Seems possible, there you go. More it's a better, yeah, it's a better benchmark as well because it's people that you know. It's not professional gamers, right? It's people like you, supposedly. Yep. So if you look at this, it, this is really this way that they have of looking at the scoring and how that scoring is done really brings them into a community. You really feel like you're part of this Candy Crush community that exists out there. And in fact, sometimes you'll get crushed and there'll be a group from your community that will ask you together and you guys chat on how you're doing, that sort of thing. It really is that tie that binds that brings you together. I thought this morning there was a gentleman who asked a question of Jeremiah on this collaborative economy. And if you remember that question, he asked, you know, there's two C's that are involved in that collaborative economy. One is commerce, but the other C was community. And community, I think, is an equally strong motivator uh, in the marketplace today, especially for the millennials. They want to belong to a community. They need to belong to a community. And that's one of the things, I think, that motivates them in such a strong fashion. So community, I believe, is one of, again, the third real strong lesson that we have from uh, the social area. So let me show you uh, a couple of examples here that I think are really interesting. So the city of Honolulu um, had a whole set of data. They had all this information that existed. But just as everybody is experiencing uh, the cr crunch in the economy today, they didn't have enough folks to take that data 
and do something with it so that they could be more productive. So they, at the time, did something that was quite unusual. They decided to create a community for their citizens. And they called that community uh, Can Do Honolulu. It was citizens analyzing numbers, discover opportunity. That was their community. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to release this data to all of the citizens of Honolulu and provide them with the ability to create an application, whether that's social or not social, but to create an application that could help out Honolulu. Now, I found this quite interesting. In fact, when they came up with the idea, uh, they were actually in a group of other cities Every other city in the group, of which there were 47 other cities in this community together, said, this will never work. No one's going to work for you for free, right? Because these citizens would donate this stuff back to the city of Honolulu. Nobody has the time. I mean, think how busy you guys are. And so this is going to completely fail. But actually, the opposite happened. They created this can-do community. So it's a social community that exists out there. And they told the citizens, Here's the data. The data is available for free, but any work that you do with the, with the data would be given back free to, um, to Honolulu. Now, if you think about millennials, think about some of the things that motivate millennials today. One of the big things, or I'll ask you, what, what, do you, what kind of things do you think motivates millennials to be part of a community like this where they're going to donate back their service? Ideas? A it's a game. What else? This is, a, this is a big one for millennials. So they feel like they're contributing. They're making a difference. In fact, um, IBM just conducted a study for millennials. The number one motivating factor for them is that they feel like they're making a difference in the world. Actually, greater than their pay, greater than working <laughs> conditions, is am I making an impact in the world? So one of the things that the, the team in Honolulu did is as they were looking at social to put around the campaign, if you would, to get people to join, is they talked about how this work would be used for making a difference. Maybe not in the world, but making a difference in Hawaii. And they not only went after millennials, but they also went after the rest of the population, but with the focus and the message on the millennials. And so I wanted to tell you some of the outcomes of this social community. Um, First of all, they created a whole set of apps that were usable by the city of Honolulu. Let me just give you a couple that I think were interesting. So they created an app called uh, Dubus, and that's really how you say it, Dubus. I'm not just being cool and hip up here. Um, and uh, Dubus is a simple social application. What they were sharing is information about the bus schedules. Just like an airline, a plane, like my plane was late last night and I knew that ahead of time because of the airline, the bus systems in Honolulu, they didn't have a way to know if the bus was going to be late or early or if there's a traffic jam. So they created this app so that you could see the time frames and the, the folks, again, would unite to say, okay, there's an accident here, tell the bus driver, avoid this area, avoid that area. So the app turned out to be used by not just the citizens, but by the, the bus companies there to improve their on-time delivery. Um, another app that they created that I think is really interesting and another social app is a tsunami warning system. So this app would do two things. One, the city of Honolulu had sirens up in the area so they could warn people, but they didn't have enough folks to go around and check the sirens. So they actually form communities of siren checkers. So you actually get a little badge, again, some of that gamification, besides your name if you're a siren checker for your community. They actually do parties for the siren checkers, kind of like what Yelp does, right? If anybody's rated top of the line in Yelp, they do Yelp parties to reward those folks. So the same kind of idea to reward the siren checkers. But they would also then, uh, in the social community, route that information back to the city so the city could then focus on those areas that had issues or challenges. Now, remember, this is a volunteer army that's writing these apps, coming up with the ideas, creating the apps, using the apps, and dedicating them back. Did you know that Japan has now asked for the, the source for this application for the tsunami that they could roll it out in the country of Japan? Again, an app that's been sourced by free developers community, kind of what Jeremiah was talking about today, right? A collaborative sharing society leveraging that in Japan, which I thought was really interesting. And then the last example here I'll give you, which I think is really interesting, 
is uh, they actually created for the tourists, a lot of the citizens got together and you know they make most of their commerce on tourism. And so they said, well, there's all these, you know, there's TripAdvisor, there's tons of, of apps out there, but we can do better. We're gonna make a local Hawaii app called TripIt, and it's gonna be locals telling tourists where to go, what to do. Now you've heard of that before, but this one is actually sourced and content is updated on an hourly basis by a volunteer army. Very social, people comment on each other, they change and they quickly adapt, and so they now have this trip it out. So, as you would imagine, this has worked quite well for the city of Honolulu. Um, we recently hosted the city of Sydney, who is adopting this, and they've tried it first on uh, bicycle routes, sharing information about dangerous intersections for bicyclists. We've now uh, rolled it out to the city of Lisbon, and the list goes on. So I thought it was quite interesting that the city of Honolulu used this concept of bringing together a community to, uh, as this young lady in the front row said, do something for the common good and leverage that social interaction to create a stronger community inside of Honolulu that gives back not just to Honolulu but to other cities as well. Had you guys heard this story? It was in the Wall Street Journal. Okay. okay, but I thought that was really quite interesting. So then how could you take something like that and then leverage it for yourselves? So again, I wanted to show you an example. Uh, this is an IBM example of drinking our own champagne. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to have our, um, our folks at IBM out there talking in the social world, in the blogosphere. I don't know if you guys know this, but the number one thing that impacts your brand is actually not your advertising, it's not your direct mail pieces, it's none of those, it's actually your employees. Did you guys know that? Number one impact of brand, it, was just, it just came out in one of the brand, recent branding studies. Because when you're at a cocktail party and you say, hey Tom, what's it like working at IBM? Do you like it? I love it. <laughs> hey, I, I heard, look forward to it. hey. <laughs> And I heard that IBM just released this new analytics product. And if he says, oh yeah, you know, I know about that and it's really good, you guys will believe him over someone else because he's speaking as a person to peer you, peer-to-peer, peer, not as an IBM or to you. So how do you create, we have 480,000 people that work at IBM, how do you create that voice so that people have freedom to express themselves and to be authentic Right? You want them to be authentic as they speak, but you want them to be a, also a community that wants to help out your company, a company like IBM. So there's a couple things that we, we did. Um, the first thing we did to create that brand army is we did training. So we trained everybody on the tools that existed out there, whether that was you know, Twitter or Facebook, or for some of the technical communities, because IBM is a technical company, GitHub and Stack Overflow. Now I bring those up because I know when I work with a lot of companies, they always want to focus on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. But for your own industry, a lot of times there are communities that are much stronger and much more influential that exist within your industry. Banking has one, for instance, the ABA has a very strong community. You know, technologists, GitHub and Stack Overflow actually trump everything else. So learning and figuring out what community matters to your constituents is, is a really important part of creating that community. So we trained folks. We taught them what communities would be most influential. Uh, we also have something called business conduct guidelines and a set of social guidelines. So we actually gave them boundaries, right? You can talk about anything you want, but you can't talk about a new confidential product, right? You probably wouldn't talk about that in a, in a cocktail hour. So you shouldn't talk about that on social media. Um, so interesting piece of research that came out. Um, kids in a playground, so this is psychology, kids in a playground, when they have no fence, they tend to play in the center of a playground. They don't wander off. And you know why? Because they don't know where the boundaries are. And it's interesting, right? You would imagine that with no boundaries that you would go explore. But all the studies show you actually opposite, that when you have no boundaries, you tend to stay and huddle in a circle because you don't know where the boundaries are. And when you put boundaries up, what kids tend to do is they go to the fence, they go to the edge of the boundaries, right? They go all through the playground. So now imagine that in your company. 
That's how I think about social guidelines. It's not to box someone in, it's actually to provide freedom to your employees so that they know where they can go, what they can do, what's okay for them. And so when you put a set of social media guidelines in place or business conduct guides in place, we found that it actually helps and encourages people to share, not the opposite of what people actually think. Sandy, I have a, a yeah, quick sure. question. Uh, what happens if you have employees who that's not their strength? I mean, uh, are, is there a danger in creating a system that re rewards someone who's good at social media when their expertise may be valuable to the company in other ways? And, and how do you make them not feel that they're, you know, out of step? It's a great question. So um, what we do at IBM is we have multiple reward systems. So for instance, we give rewards for patents. Now if you think about a patent, what's that? It's about the most unsharing thing you could imagine, right? Because you're being rewarded for something that no one else has done. You haven't worked with anybody else on it. You patent it, and then for anybody else to use it, they have to pay you, right? So it's really not socially sharing and giving out there, but we do reward for patents, right? Because it's an important part of our business. So we have multiple reward systems that we do, Tom. It's a great question, though, because every company should look at that. You, I don't think you should reward ever on one thing. Um, but it's a great lead-in because the third thing that we did, in addition to providing guidelines and education, the next thing we did is we created a rock star program. So because we had other reward systems, like patents, for instance, we wanted folks to know that just as much as we value you know, the patent or people manager or other things, we also value you sharing out in social. And so we actually created a dashboard that, that has a um, point system on it so we can see how folks are doing. They can see themselves. Again, kind of gamification. But more importantly, what this has done is it's united people around a set of topics you know, for us, we're a technology company, so we now have a strong community around cloud, a strong community around analytics. You know, think about the communities you would have. Um, you know, I work with a um, retailer. They have a community around fragrance. They have a community around fashion jewelry. They have a community around handbags. So think about the communities that you might form and how you would get them to come together. For us, our rock star um, leaderboard around these different categories has helped bring them together in a community so that they now have a voice on behalf of IBM in the marketplace. That's an authentic voice. It has guidelines and it has training, but it's their voice, not IBM's voice as well. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. I'm gonna go on to number four, but before I do that, any questions so far? Anything confusing or anything you wanted to know more about? Is this helpful so far? Yeah, okay. Okay, Tom, any other questions you have? Not yet. Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. I can't wait. Um, okay, so our, um, our fourth lesson, um, when you're playing Candy Crush, one of the things that tends to happen is that every level you have different things you have to do. So in one level you might have to get three candies together and in another level you have to get one certain color or a fruit down to the bottom. So they change it up on you. Now, when you go through about 10 levels and you've got to get three colors together and you come to the next level, what do you think the first thing you do is? Even though the rules have changed, what do you think the first thing you do is? Do it the old way? Do it the old way. You look for the old patterns, right? Because you're used to looking for the old patterns. So I would find myself stuck on this level. Are you playing Candy Crush while I'm speaking? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, so while, so while you're, you know, you're in the moment and you're moving along and you're seeing, okay, I've got to match these patterns. This is the winning formula. This is the winning formula. Going to match the patterns. Then the rules change. So now you've got to look for something different, right? You've got to look for the striped. You've got to, you've got to have more of these little donuts with sprinkles on them. And that's why my fortune cookie, opportunities are everywhere, but few have eyes to see them, I think is really important. Um, and I just want to pause here for a second because I think this is important not just for social but for the fast-moving world that we live in today, right? I mean, one of the things that I really loved about um, social media shakeup and what Robin's put together here is that the sessions this morning that I saw, they're not about here's the world today, they're about where the world is going. 
right? And so what she's trying to do is break down. We're, we're used to seeing the three green candies in a row or the three yellow candies in a row. And what the session this morning did is to say, hey, the world is changing now. There's different patterns that you've got to see. And so you've got to open your eyes to these opportunities that exist out there that aren't necessarily the same as what you had before. Does that make sense to everybody? I think that's a pretty prof at least prof profound uh, lesson that I got this morning. And then, see, so you didn't know all these lessons were hidden in Candy Crush, right? So many good things out there. I know you guys are going to start playing. Right, Tom? You just uh, signed up, uh, right? I'm going to ask my daughter what level <laughs> <laughs> OK. So a um, couple of examples I wanted to give you here about using social to find some of those opportunities. So if you think about going to a game or going to a concert, what kinds of things motivate you to go? What would make you go to a game or go to a concert in your, you know, in your area? Not a trick question. What? Who? You're a fan. Yep. The energy. Energy. Your friends are going. Entertainment. Would. What is it? Free trip. Free trip. <laughs> Ballpark hot dogs. Ballpark. Okay, great. Hot dogs. I knew Tom would throw in the winner. The winner one there. Well. So this is an inter. Thank you. This is the interesting point. So, stadium. How many of you go to an event because of the stadium? I actually don't. I go for the band or for what's happening. But how many people go for the stadium? Apparently you do. So I should have pulled you along with me when I, when I worked with these guys. So this is the Sun Life Stadium. And they came to us and they said, hey, we want to make people choose stuff because of us, because of the stadium. And of course, we were sitting around brainstorming with them, and I was sitting there going, oh my god, no one's going to come to the stadium, you know, get more bands, get more of this. But then we, we again, you know, we don't want to get into the pattern of looking for the three green things. We want to look ahead. We want to look differently at this. So we thought, well, what would cause you to go to a stadium? Um, I just took my daughters to a Taylor Swift concert. Anybody ever been to one of those? I actually didn't even hear Taylor Swift sing because of all the Young girls? No, not the screaming. All the girls sing along. Has anybody ever been to the experiences? All the girls are singing. So I didn't actually hear Taylor Swift. I heard all the girls around me singing. And then um, I, we took my husband with me, and he, I think, was the only guy in the whole stadium. So he said, man, if I was single, I'd hang out at Taylor Swift concerts, right? But all the girls are here. Um, so if you think about it, we drove around and around, and we were looking for parking. We couldn't find a parking spot. The lines for concessions were super long. So that particular uh, stadium and the way that it was orchestrated, when another group was coming back that my daughters wanted to go to, I was like, oh, you know, let's go to this stadium because, you know, maybe it'll be better. So I started to think, oh, there are reasons I might go to one stadium or another. So we worked with Sun Life and we pulled together actually a social application for them. And that application, similar to what we had in the street line application, would help to simplify parking. We actually got ideas from the fans. What do you like about the parking situation? What don't you like? How could we improve it? And you would not believe millions of people, millions of people gave us ideas about how to improve the parking. Um, they orchestrated something like what Streetline did to, to identify open parking spaces. The other was the long concession lines. We asked the fans, what would you like to see? How would you like us to orchestrate that? Um, and they gave us lots of ideas. I mean, some basic ones, like have more people on at breaks, that kind, of, that kind of thing. But also some really interesting ones about how to separate food so there wouldn't be such long lines for different things. Um, as a result, um, Sun Life Stadium now has the highest loyalty for a stadium. There's actually a group that rates this, by the way. Um, Highest loyalty for a stadium in the United States is now with Sun Life because of their use of social. So the re I wanted you to think about this. Again, thinking back to this morning, right? We had Jeremiah who kind of taught us you can't just look for the three, three candies in a row anymore. There's a new paradigm out there. We're looking at things differently. For your business, maybe there's something that you haven't thought about that social could bring out that could be a differentiator for you that you can leverage the social crowd to teach you how to position, how to change the game for your industry to make it uh, different and make it better. 
Um, I wanted to show you, uh, hang on one second, David. I got a great friend back there, David, who's going to help me out with this video. So one of the things I wanted to do was, um, as I was looking again at drinking our own champagne at IBM, how could we change the game? And so my, one of my teams in India, super creative team, came up with an idea to leverage both social as well as social media online, as well as real in-person contact to create a phenomena. And what we wanted to do was to create these opportunities in a way that wasn't normal for IBM. So I want to show you a little video. It's only like two minutes. You can go out there and look at the video. We just posted it. We already have about 38,000 viewings of it. Now this is for a tech company. And this is going to be a flash mob. And they're going to be dancing for a cloud platform. Now, would you guys have ever thought about that? OK, so let me just show you. I also want to tell you the dancers in here is actually my team in India. These are not professional dancers. I just want you to take a look at this. So David, could you play it? Are you ready? that's shocking about that is that those are actually IBMers, <laughs> right? Um, very creative. Now, so what they did, again, thinking about to Sun Life Stadium, trying to figure out what would attract people, what's differentiating. So we have technology, right? And so why would you do a flash mob around technology? Well, they're actually doing this in, a, in an area in India where a lot of developers, that's our target market, exist. We wanted to show them that it is energetic and that this platform is for the new millennials. And so we didn't do typical IBM advertising or something that was normal. We tried to do, we did a flash mob. And you know, dancing is really big. It's a part of the culture that exists in India. And then we supplemented that with social behind it. So we touched all those people who were there as well as then we put this out on YouTube and several of their local social areas so that the energy then could be felt around the world. So again, identifying opportunities, using social in a way that you might not expect it to, but breaking down some of those patterns. Um, I will tell you that right now for this particular technology, um, and because of several of the things that they've done here socially, they have actually now had more downloads of this product, which is how we measure success, than the United States. They're number one in the world right now. They've also outpaced China based on their social techniques. So we're leveraging some of their best practices around the world. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. So thinking outside of what you think What's is normal for your industry. Sorry? What's the product that people The product is called Bluemix. It's our, it's our brand new cloud platform. So millennials, anybody can download it to develop an app. Mm -hmm. Yep. OK. Oops. That's me next. Sorry. Thank you, David. Um, so I also wanted to show you a, a more IBM-ish, but a, still a little bit so, a very social way that we also identify opportunities. So this is called our Client Experience GM. And what we wanted to do is we have 480,000 IBMers, and we know that a lot of great ideas comes from those IBMers. We also have some great clients and some great partners. So we decided as we wanted to reinvent the way we did that client experience, think back to what Sun Life did again, right? They went to their fans. So that's what we decided to do. We're going to go to our employees, we're going to go to our customers, we're going to go to our partners, and we're going to let them tell us ideas about products, experiences that they wanted to see. So we had produced in a um, three-day period, so this happened three days, it was worldwide, so it occurred across the world at the same time. So essentially, ideas are flowing in 24 by, by 7, right, all day long. 
And we use social analytics, which I think is another really important fact here, to sort the threads and group them into categories. And um, over those three days, we wrote 11 million words, or about 200 novels worth of ideas that came into IBM about new product innovation, about client experience, about things that we might position ourselves. We had people designing whole ad campaigns for us. Um, and of course, we've leveraged this now in several ways to make uh, investments. Our CEO put a bunch of money behind the ideas that came in. Um, in fact, one of those was to productize Watson. I don't know if you guys remember Watson, the computer that played, okay. So one of the ideas was to, comp was to productize that. Uh, we were using that as a demonstration of our research capability and many customers said, oh my gosh, package that up and sell me like little Watson Jr. because I want Watson doing work for me. Um, and then there are lots of employee ideas. Any IBMer in the room can tell you we have our 139 principles that came out of this particular piece of work as well. So again, using social, using the crowd to identify opportunities, not just your employees, but bringing together all your constituents, uh, you know, customers, partners, and your employees to come up with these great new and innovative Sandy, ideas. can you tell yeah. us here off the record some of the silliest or weirdest ideas? They came through? Um, yeah, so I'll tell you one, which I still don't, uh, maybe someone was pregnant, but they suggested that we serve pickles at every, uh, at lunch and in the break rooms. And the idea was voted upon like, I don't know if someone's being funny, but like 10,000 votes came in for serving pickles. Now I love pickles too, but it was a really uh, interesting idea, I thought, uh, moving forward. So that's just some of the ideas, but we had really really interesting ideas and ones that we've now had our research group working on and others as well. I think another part of, of using this and seeing different opportunities that I think is really important is that we didn't just ask for ideas, but we demonstrated that we use the ideas. So let me tell you a story. I was recently working with a client and we did a cultural assessment. You know, one of my favorite sayings is culture eats strategy for lunch. Because you can have a great social plan, but your culture will also trump, always trump your strategy, always, right? So culture eats strategy for lunch. And so as we were going through this, we did a cultural assessment, which we do before we do any social project with a company. And our social assessment said that this company actually didn't want ideas from others. They felt like they had all the ideas themselves. But for some reason, I think their CEO had read a article probably flying in the, you know, in the Delta magazine or something that said you should do social. So he decided we have to do social. So they actually put up a site that solicited ideas from their employees and their customers. Um, and I was on the project team. We kept telling them, well, you know, this might be a way to change your culture, right? But at the end, we had the site up for a week. And I went back out just to check and see how my customers do, and the site was down. So I was worried, you know, wow, did something happen? I need to call. So I called right away, and I called the CEO. And um, he said, I said, hey, you know, I just noticed that your site's down. I saw people commenting. You got really good response. He goes, yes, I saw that. And I was like, oh, well, what happened? He goes, did you see some of those comments those clients were writing in? I said, yeah, I did. And he said, I don't agree with any of them. So I decided to pull the site down. So culturally, they weren't willing to accept ideas from others, right? And so he pulled the site down. Now what would have been better? That he put up the site and pull it down or that he never put up the site? Never put up the site, right? Because it's not authentic. And actually six months later, this particular CEO actually was moved off, voted off by the board, and a new CEO came in who would listen to the clients. And I actually believe that that was actually started because he had this great idea, right? But his culture, his culture and, and who he was, he wasn't being authentic. He was doing it because he thought he had to do a social project. Everybody was doing it, he read about it, but they weren't authentic in their goal and their pursuit of what this was about, right? Because social is not, a, it's not a technology, right? Social is a relationship. It's about a relationship you have with your clients, with your employees, and people can see right away, or not, maybe sometimes not right away, but in the long run, they always see the truth. Always the truth will come out, right? And, and Sandy, I, I guess that is the other side of the question I asked before, which is that how can people here who are, um, you know, uh, not the CEOs, kind of bring this kind of innovation and technology and culture uh, to their CEO 
what are the arguments for them to make, um, you know? Well, one of the things that I love to use is we created a um, cultural assessment. And we go in and we all work, we can work, and you, I actually posted it to my blog, so if you want to go out to Social Business Sandy, it's posted there, you can tweet me and I can send it to you. It's just a really simple little assessment. It looks at things like, how do you respond to failure? Um, you know, are you a continuous learning organization or do you do learning once a year? So it's a set of questions that kind of gives a clue to what your culture is like and how well you'll accept social, use social, and have successful social projects. And that's one way to identify that anybody can use, any social change agent can use to share with their manager or their board, depending upon where they are, that they can say, you know, these are some of the things that social can help us with. Or consultants to their clients. <laughs> or consultants to their clients, yeah. However, there is another, another favorite saying that I have, is that social doesn't change your culture. Social reveals your culture. You've got to think hard about that, right? Social does not change your culture. Social reveals your culture. So, if you are fabulous at customer support and customer experience, it's going to amplify that, and that's going to be fabulous. But if you have a gap, it's also going to point out that gap. And that's why a lot of C-suite folks are getting nervous about it, because it's going to point out the gap, right? So this, the assessment actually enables you to find some of those gaps ahead of time so that you can address them or choose a project that emphasizes your strength, not necessarily a place that you have your weakness. And I, and I think if you want <laughs> extra ammunition, uh, on, uh, uh, Sandy has posted some web, some, uh, some videos that, uh, where she talks about the ROI on social. And that, you know, also in the business environment really um, is powerful. Simon, do you have a question? Yeah, I did have a question because I thought that was a really interesting comment. I, I guess my question for you, Sandy, is so, so I understand that, that social makes the culture clearer. Does, does it also, in your opinion, uh, make culture more operationally significant because people can act on pure culture in a way that, where they used to rely on process? Is that, is that too much of a stretch? Or? No, I think that's absolutely true. I think that a lot of companies have magnificent cultures that could be an extreme part of their competitive advantage. And they don't leverage it as much, and social can help them leverage that. And I've seen that happen in multiple, multiple companies. In fact, right now I'm working with a, um, a luxury brand. And we're using social and working directly with the CEO. And, and she recognizes that culture is a critical part that they haven't really leveraged. And so she's empowering now the employees in order to, again, strengthen her client experience. Yeah, you know, this came up, to, well, this came up earlier this week on a panel we did with a guy who was um, standing the crystals today and now works with them in his new company. And they were talking about how that happened at Joint Special Operations Command, of all places. And, and, and essentially, they went from a kind of process-driven world to a, a the culture was what was driving the operations of the place you know, more than ever. And that's how they solved some pretty big problems that they had there 10 years ago. Yeah. I want to announce that we're now giving Simon a rock star point for that <laughs> question. And we want to encourage all of you to compete with him by asking <laughs> better questions, OK? Uh, but I'll also tell you that um, one of the surprising things I've learned doing this is that Germany today is one of the fastest countries moving ahead in social. A surprise to me, right? I would never expect, I hope there's nobody German in here, but I wouldn't have expected that. Um, but, but, the, oh, you are, oh. Sorry about that. I would have expected it, but it's true. So Germany right now is number one in social deployments. And why is that? Because one of the things I think that's so interesting is that they are so process focused and that many of the great companies there have now embedded social into the process. So they've embedded the culture into their process, you know, or changed their process, but it's very process focused. And that's also enabled them to be successful partially because it's part of their culture. And then companies I work with in Latin America, they pr approach it differently. So they do approach it with their culture in mind, which I think is really important. Okay, I've just been given the three minute warning. So let me see if I can get through the last two because I think you'll find some good nuggets in here too. So 
Um, and again, I really and truly got this from a fortune cookie at P.F. Chang's. Um, the, for, the wise man forfeits his fortune when he does not trust uh, the data. So I thought this was interesting because in Candy Crush, if you're looking at it, um, there's lots of people who are going to give you advice. Remember, it's linked into Facebook, right? So people are all the time, they're like, oh, Sandy, you know, watch out for the striped candy. Watch out for this. Don't do this. Don't do that. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I've got so many people giving me opinions. I need, some, I need some data, right? I need to look at this in a way that I can structure it. I want to use both that crowdsourcing and leverage this in a, in a smart way. And I'll show you some facts here coming up in a second from a study we did. <laughs> Those companies who are leveraging social analytics are the furthest ahead in social deployment. So doing social without analytics has not yielded as much success or as strong of ROI. So that analytics piece of social well, it kind of seems contradictory, right? Because you're going with the flow and you're using culture, you're using the crowd, but the analytics piece helps really to frame it and to make it more, more special. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this one's I've used, but I love the story of Lowe's. One of the things that they did is they rolled out social for all of their employees to better help their clients. And so one day they were rolled out all these communities. Uh, this community was the paint community. Now, I want to belong to the paint community. Anybody else want to belong to that paint community? So this paint community, um, one of their employees decided one night that she was selling these trays. And you can see the tray right there. And uh, she was selling a good, better, best tray. And everybody was buying the good tray because it was cheapest and not the best tray. So she said, well, is the best tray really worth five times the price as the good tray? So she did a, an experiment, and she determined it was. So she set it up in her store. She sold that of her trays in 24 hours, her best paint trays in 24 hours. Now, if there had been no social, that store for Lowe's would have been a very successful store. But it turns out that Lowe's had leveraged social. So she shared that story in, her social, in the social network that was private to Lowe's, but throughout uh, the, the area. And because of that, other stores started to replicate what she had done. In one month, Lowe's had generated an additional million dollars of profit from this one social idea. One idea shared. One, not a gazillion, one idea. Million dollars of additional profit. So sharing that idea was um, you know, extremely important to her. And the interesting thing is then Lowe's used the data. So now we've got all these stores replicating the data. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, our supply chain back-end system says we should only deliver five of these trays. So they use the data to actually alter their supply chain. So they use the combination of social plus data, analytics, to make this a real successful end-to-end -end solution for, um, for Lowe's. Um, and then I wanted to show you this. I think this is really cool. Um, from Watson now, so again, think about that idea to, to make it into a product. You can now actually determine your, um, and I'm going to ignore you just for a second, okay? She just told me to stop, but I'm going to just continue just for a couple more minutes. Um, sorry about that. I just wanted, I wanted to let you know that I'm... I'm moderating the next panel. So oh, okay. Okay, okay, good. Okay. So, so what Watson can do now is it can take 200 tweets or 200 of your social posts, and it can analyze your personality. Um, I didn't believe it at first. They did 500,000 people, and 500,000 people said, yep. That's my personality. I still didn't believe it. Uh, I wasn't born in Missouri, but I was like, show me. So they actually ran it for me, and I was like, oh my gosh. Someone had like this fortune ball, and they, they saw me. So this is data now. And now we have retailers that are doing recommendations, not based on past history of purchase, but based on personality traits. So think about that, right? So let's say, you know, um, Tom and I, you know, we don't, we haven't purchased the same thing, but we have a similar personality. So now they make a recommendation to me based on my personality, not just based on my past purchases. In the stores that we pilot in, the retailers we pilot in, the cross-sell upsell is 27 to 29% higher based on personality match versus a past history match. Okay, really quickly, I've got uh, just a couple more charts I wanted to share with you. Um, this is number six, which is don't wait too late, the time is now. We've recently conducted, and up in the IBM booth, the whole study is there, a study of 1,500 com uh, country companies uh, in every continent except for Antarctica, and we've looked for, we've done this every year for a while, 
um, we've looked for trends. So one of the things that we've looked at in these trends is that social deployments over the last two years have more than doubled. And if you look at this, we looked at no plans, you know, started with a, with a you know, pilot, limited deployment. The numbers are really staggering at the uh, number of companies who are now deploying social and leveraging it in what they're doing. And we looked at the pace setters. The pace setters are those who are outperforming in the marketplace. So that means these are guys who are doing better in the business. And we found that they're using social six times approximately more than others when they use social, in, first of all, for employees to improve that communication and collaboration, and secondly, in customer experience. So if you look at the study, it's really fascinating how these pay setters, which were about two -third, I mean, one-third of the study, how they're using social in different ways than those who are laggards in the industry around social. Okay? So takeaways, you ready? Number one, if you're having trouble captivating your audience, whether that's employees or customers, try some sort of gamification, some sort of motivation that can help you. Number two, being indispensable means now sharing your expertise, not hoarding information, not holding back that information. That is a, a sea change. That's different than the past. Number three, healthy competition breeds healthy communities. So look at how you're generating communities in the marketplace. Number four, in social, focus on the trees, not just the forest. So make sure that you're looking at this in all angles and reevaluating your, your look as you move along. Uh, number five, social analytics are a must. Our pace setters, six to one, all leverage social analytics versus the laggards who had no analytic capability in what they were doing. And then finally, last but not least, don't let great be the barrier to get started. Right? You, this is the whole world of experimentation. Get started now. So thank you so much for your time. Bye.